Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you to my YouTube channel presenting before you this wonderful tutorial is your mentor, Pure Clement. So today we will be looking at um, linear momentum and collisions. So this is a very uh, wonderful topic in physics. It's very important uh, because it shows how objects, how we are able to calculate the momentum of objects that uh, really are in motion. Because we know that these objects, they have uh, some mass and at the same time they move at a certain velocity. And if we were to go deep, we discover that as these objects move, and we imagine that these objects are coming from opposite directions and they are meeting at some point X, then we discover that these objects are capable of colliding. It may be a head-to-head -head collision, or it may be a back-to-back -back collision. I'm sure you understand. To those of you that have seen vehicles, you are able to see vehicles collide with each other. And when vehicles collide with each other, you are able to see the impact that is caused due to the collision, due to the force that has been applied okay, between those two objects. So the topic of momentum and collisions it really helps us to understand how we are able to calculate the momentum and the, 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 the impact of collision, either before collision or after collision. So after this lesson, I will be able to provide you with quite a number of practice questions. But first of all, I'm going to teach you so that you are able to learn something. Okay. So at the end of it all, you will be able to define what momentum is. You will be able to uh, bring out most of the concepts under momentum. And at the same time, you will also be able to understand what an impulse is in physics. You shall also be able to understand the law of conservation of momentum. To conserve is simply to uh, 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 really uh, not lose any anything, okay? You, you, you use something, but at the end of it, or you don't really lose it, okay? That is to conserve. You are conserving, okay? Then collisions, I'm sure you understand what it means to collide, okay? So if you say two people collide, or uh, there was a collision, then automatically what you are talking about is, you know, uh, uh, they bumped into each other. Okay, so uh, let's, let's now discuss what momentum is. Let's now discuss what momentum is. Now, I want you to imagine that there be an object that is moving in the right direction. And that object, let's say it's moving at a speed of 3 meters per second, okay, in the right. And at the same time, let's also imagine that there be an object which is moving to the left, and that object is moving at a certain speed. I'm sure you are able to see these uh, human beings, these guys, these cartoons that are playing here. They are, they are, they are, they are skating, and they, they, they do have... Uh, uh, balls that they are, they are throwing around. I want you to picture these two. You discover that uh, these, these two human beings, or let me call them objects as in physics, they do possess a certain mass, but at the same time, they are capable of moving in the right direction. Okay? So the ability of them possessing that mass and be able to move in the right direction at a certain speed, that relationship that is between the, the speed 
in meters per second and the mass in kgs. That is simply what we are calling as the momentum. So now here they are saying, how can the effect of catching a slow, heavy object be the same as catching a fast, lightweight object? The answer is they have the same momentum. So momentum doesn't change. It, 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 it is not affected by how lightweight something is or, uh, or whatever. It is simply that relationship that is between the velocity and the mass. Okay? That relationship that is between the velocity and the mass. So I want you to be very, very good at imagining so that you shall be able to understand what I will be saying. Okay? Now, from what I've said, momentum is therefore defined as the mass multiplied by the velocity. Okay? So that relationship that is between the mass and the velocity, that is the momentum. Now, I'm sure you are able to see this formula here. This is the definition of momentum. It is simply the mass the mass times the velocity. It is simply the product of the mass times the velocity. So momentum is represented by a symbol P, then it is equal to the mass multiplied by the velocity. Okay, there's an arrow on top there, that's, ver uh, that's velocity vector. And of course we know that the mass is measured in kgs then the velocity is in meters per second. Therefore, these are the units for momentum. It's just kg meters per second. Okay. Since momentum is the product of mass and velocity, an object's momentum changes whenever its mass or velocity changes. So, like I said in the first place, this is just a relationship that is shared between velocity and mass. Because we know that P is equal to M multiplied by V. This is a direct proportional relationship in that if you apply some, uh, uh, some increase in mass, then automatically you affect the momentum. Or, you look at this relationship, P is equals to MV, if you increase the velocity, the speed at which this object moves, then automatically you expect the momentum to increase. If you reduce the mass, you expect the momentum to reduce. So whatever you do to each of these, then automatically it's going to produce a result, which is going to be proportional to the momentum okay now the units of momentum are kg multiplied by meters per second of course this you know now momentum is sometimes referred to as the, 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 the linear momentum to distinguish it from angular momentum a quantity associated with a rotating object so linear momentum is simply momentum for objects that are moving in straight lines so if you are able to see, if you, if you can imagine the motion of a car, let's say a vehicle in your mind, which is moving in a straight road, that is a very good example of linear momentum. Angular momentum, you can think of, um, you can think of something which is rotating, something which is rotating, or let's say a person gets on a bicycle, then they start you know, moving in a circle, okay, in a circle at some angle theta, then automatically uh, that is angular momentum. In other words, we take, we, we do take note of the angle. There must be some angle somewhere which is associated with the mass and at the same time with the velocity, okay? So it's very much important to take note of that. Now, momentum is a vector quantity. In other words, it's got direction, and at the same time, it's got magnitude, okay? It's a vector quantity. You need to take note of that. 
the momentum vector points in the same direction as the velocity vector. Okay? So from that relationship that we established, we say that P is equal to MV. P had a vector on top pointing to the right. If you check in the formula, the velocity as well, that velocity, okay? The velocity also has an arrow on top to simply show that the direction of the momentum is simply the direction of the velocity, okay? Now, the following example clearly illustrates why the vector nature of momentum must be taken into account when determining the change in momentum of an object. Okay? So now I think we do have these cartoons. We do have these cartoons here. Now, in the first, we, 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 we have a, a door here. I don't know what this is. Get bear, then we have an orange. Now, I want to show you how uh, uh, this is useful. Now, the figure below shows two objects, a beanbag bear and a rubber ball, each with the same mass and same uh, downward speed just before hitting the, the floor. So they were released from the same height they, they do have the same mass and with the same speed, okay? Now you discover that this dead bear, it, it, this, this bear, it, 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 it reaches the ground fast, but this guy here reaches the ground uh, 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 before the, the bear. Now if they ask you what is the momentum of the object, it is the same. Why? Because it's pointing in the same direction. Okay? Remember, as long as the mass and the velocity are the same, it doesn't matter the period of time at which they reach the ground. What matters is the mass and the velocity. So, of course, they do have the same momentum. Now, if the beanbag has a mass of 1 kg, we have a very good example here. If the beanbag has a mass of 1 kg and is moving downward with a speed of 4 meters per second just before coming to rest on the floor, then this change in momentum is... Now, here we are discussing about the change in momentum. And every time you are talking about change, remember you are considering uh, some momentum final minus some momentum initial, okay? Some momentum final minus some momentum initial. So now, this is the same as, remember, this object is see, falling to the ground. It's coming from upward, if you are able to imagine it. The object is falling from upward, it's going downward. So, of course, we expect it to have a negative velocity vector because it's falling downward, okay? Now, since we know that change in momentum is going to equal to the, change, the, the, the final momentum minus the initial momentum, now the initial momentum, the, sorry, the final momentum is simply that momentum of the object when it reaches its final destination where it is equal to zero. So since you've not been given, it's going to equal zero. So it's going to be zero minus, then since the, the, the direction of the speed was negative, you put your negative four in the brackets. And if you multiply, then of course, it's going to be a positive four kg meter per second. So I'm sure you understand how everything is moving about. A 1 kg rubber ball with a speed of 4 meters per second just before hitting the floor will bounce upward with the same speed. Therefore, the ball's change in momentum is. Now, this time around, this time around, we have been given um, an object which is, which when it falls, okay, when it falls on the ground or hit, when it hits the floor, then automatically we expect it to bounce upward, 
Okay? With the same speed, remember the mass doesn't change. But here we have been told that with the same speed. Now, since this object is hitting the floor and we expect it to bounce upward, then automatically we know that whatsoever value of momentum that we are going to find in the first place, we are going to double it. Why? Because its, its movement was doubled. It first of all hit the ground, that is the first uh, momentum, then it bounced upward, that is the second momentum. So if you add the two, you will get 8 kg meter per second. It's very simple. Now, the total momentum of a system of objects is the vector sum of the momentums of all the individual objects. This point is very important and I want you to take note of it. The total momentum of a system of objects is the vector sum of the momentums of all the individual objects. Now, suppose we have different objects. Of, of course, we, we do have a system of objects. Then we suppose that that system of objects, each object has its own mass, and at the same time, it's, it's got its own velocity. Now, if we are asked to find the total momentum, then of course, the only thing that we are supposed to do is to find the momentum of that individual object. Upon finding the momentum of that individual object, then at the end of it all, we can find the summation of all, uh, the, of all the momentums of those objects. We find their summation. Okay, I'm sure you are able to see total momentum, total momentum, is simply pure uh, momentum one plus momentum two plus whichever so if you have 1000 objects you can calculate uh sorry if you have 1000 objects each object having its own a mass and velocity then automatically you can calculate the momentum uh, of each object then you add all of them that is the total momentum it's very simple now due to the vector nature of momentum it is possible for a system of several moving objects to have a total momentum that is positive negative or zero okay so take note of that point it's very very important it's very important you can have a momentum which is negative how is it possible that momentum is negative this time around it's very much possible because of the velocity vector in the equation let's say the velocity is in the di in the negative direction then automatically we expect that momentum to be negative okay negative momentum simply means that the object was moving in the negative direction of the x-axis or the y-axis and positive momentum simply means the object was moving in the positive direction of the x-axis or the y-axis and a zero momentum may simply mean let's say the object wasn't moving but it contains some mass then of course if we do multiply then we are going to get a zero okay so that's just all about momentum it's very simple you just consider the mass then you consider the velocity if you are asked to find the change in momentum then of course it's momentum final minus momentum initial make sure you take note of the directions of the object is it positive or negative is it bouncing upward or uh, it's just taking one route if it's bouncing upward you double the momentum that's just it okay let's get to learn something else the impulse what really is the impulse okay what really is the impulse. Now, uh, suppose you, you, you have an object. I want you to imagine an object, let's say a ball. Okay? Now, if you hit the ball, let's say with some force, then you expect that ball to simply move in the direction of the force. Now, as that object is moving in the direction of the force, you discover that there is something which counts and it doesn't stop counting, and that is called time. So as, as, as the ball uh, uh, 
keeps in its state of motion, time is running. So now, that consideration that is between the force and the time is simply what we call the impulse. It is simply the force that you are exerting on that object to put it under momentum times the time interval. So the force which you are applying on an object to put it in momentum, that force multiplied that time that it will take that object to keep its in its state of momentum, that time is now what we're calling as the impulse. Now, force is measured in newtons, time is measured in seconds. Therefore, the SI units are simply newtons, product second, or n dot s. Or, this is just the same as kg meters per second. Take note of that. Because impulse involves the product of force and time, a small force acting over a long time has the same effect as a large force acting over a short time. They are just telling you that it's not a different case of a person that is applying a huge force uh, on, on, an ob on an object uh, uh, to that one who is applying a, 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 a small force because you know that if, for example, you are pushing a car, if you push a vehicle, 20 of you, then of course you expect it to move at a high speed. So it will reach its destination in just a few seconds. But if you are just pushing a vehicle alone, you've decreased the force, then automatically you expect the time to increase. So it's not different. The effect is the same. Okay, you just multiply the force to the time. Okay. So the units of impulse are the same as the units of momentum. They don't change. Okay, they don't change. Now, impulse is a vector that points in the same direction as the force. Why is impulse a vector? Remember, it contains some force. Force, vector, quantity. Okay? So as long as there is the presence of some vector quantity in it, just know that it's going to be a vector quantity also because it points in the same direction as the force so if you hit the ball if you hit the ball then you expect the ball to go in the direction of the force there is no way you can hit the ball to the front and you and, and it goes backward it can't happen okay so the following example illustrates how impulse is calculated okay so we have a very good example here they are saying that Okay, let's see the example. They are saying, you push on a 22 kg shopping cart with a force of 6.5 newtons. If you push for 1.9 seconds, what is the magnitude of the impulse you deliver to the cart? Okay, so you have been given the mass, you have been given the force, you have been given the time. They want you to calculate the impulse. Of course, it's just one and the same. The concept is the same. Of course, you're multiplying some force to the time. So you are multiplying that force to the time, then of course you get 12 kg point um, uh, product meters per second. That, those are the units. If you multiply the two, okay. So it's 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 very simple. It's, it's very simple. Uh, suppose let's say they change whatever. You just just find the means and the ways of calculating the force. Find the means and the ways of calculating the time. If that is done, then consider everything done. You have found the need for. Okay, so there is a cartoon here trying to hit. I don't know how you call that. that. That's a ball. Let me call it a ball. As the figure indicates, when a force acts on an object, it changes the object's momentum. Okay? So, for example, if a ball is coming towards you, if a ball is coming towards you, okay? Remember, when you hit the ball, you apply a force. I want you to imagine a ball coming towards you. Then as that ball is coming towards you, you apply a certain force on that ball. Then automatically, you expect that ball to change its speed depending on the amount of force that you have applied, okay? It will change its speed. 
right? Now, that change in speed, the speed can either be in the negative direction or the positive. So now, imagine it was coming from the positive direction. Then you hit it, then the speed changes, then it begins to move in the negative direction. Then, of course, you have changed, you have changed the object's momentum. You need to take note of that. This means there must be a connection between impulse and momentum change. Okay? How, how is that connection coming in? Remember, impulse contains some force inside. Momentum contains some velocity inside. And if you apply a force on an object, then of course you expect that momentum to change. In other words, impulse has got some effect on momentum. If impulse is high, then automatically you expect some change in momentum. If, imp if impulse is zero, then you expect momentum to just remain the same way it is stationary before it, it could be put in its excitable form. Okay? So this means there must be a connection between impulse and momentum change. Now, this connection is revealed through the general formula of Newton's second law of motion. Okay? Newton's second law of motion. Now, Newton's second law of motion, what does it state? Okay, what does Newton's uh, second law of motion uh, simply states? It simply states that uh, the force applied on an object is directly proportional to its acceleration and inversely proportional to the mass. Okay, it's inversely proportional to the mass. Okay, so in other words, the more you are increasing the force, the more the acceleration, but the more you increase the mass, you don't expect the force to be more. Okay? So, uh, let's say if you have an object, imagine a ball. I want you to imagine a ball. Now, imagine you, that ball has a small mass. Okay, let's say it's, it's, it's a small ball. And then if you apply a huge force on that ball, then you expect that, that ball to simply accelerate at a higher rate. Meaning, the more the force, the more the acceleration. Therefore, force is directly proportional to the acceleration. But imagine if that object has got a huge mass. Okay, let's say it's a house. No matter the amount of force that you are going to apply, it won't move. No wonder why we are saying it's inversely proportional to the mass. In other words, the more you increase the mass, the more you reduce the force. The more you, you decrease the mass, the more you decrease the mass, the more you increase the force. Now, look at this formula. Force is equal to the change in momentum over time. How did it come about? Remember, I want you to imagine this. Remember, I want, I, want, I want you to imagine this so that we generate this formula. Remember that according to Newton's second law of motion, force is equal to mass times acceleration. So it is force equal to ma, right? ma. Now, that acceleration in its individual position, it is simply equal to Velocity over time. Okay? So meaning, force, if we replace that expression where there is acceleration, it's going to be force is equal to m multiplied by v over time. Okay? So it's going to be force equal to mv over time. Now, that mv is the momentum. Remember, momentum is equal to mv. That's the reason as to why we have replaced that one with change in momentum over time. So that is how they generated that formula. It's very simple. Okay? If we rearrange this formula, then of course, if we do more some multiplication, then we discover that impulse, which is Ft, is equal to the momentum. You've seen this relationship. This is very, very interesting. Because finally, we are able to establish the relationship between momentum and impulse. Okay, so momentum is just equal to impulse. They are equal. Now, this relationship 
is simply what we are calling as the momentum impulse theory. Momentum impulse theory. Okay? So, as we are able to see this formula, Ft is equal to change in momentum. Impulse is equal to the change in momentum. This is called the momentum impulse theorem. Okay? So, I'm sure you are able to see what's here. Okay, so it means I is equal to change in B. Okay, so this is just them explaining what impulses are about. So these are numerous examples concerning impulse. We've got rain. When the rain hits the umbrella, then automatically it's just falling downward. It continues in its motion downward. But when these ice blocks the hell, whenever they hit the umbrella, they are capable of bouncing back to the top. Therefore, you expect their momentum to double. Okay? You expect their momentum to double. And of course, their impulse is going to double. Remember, impulse, momentum, they are equal at some point. Momentum, impulse theorem. Okay, so that's just whatever uh, is happening here. They're just explaining what is happening there. So the momentum impulse theorem shows that increasing the time over which a given impulse acts decreases the average force. Okay? So I'm sure you are able to see what's happening here. Make sure you take note of the point that I've mentioned. Okay? So if you increase the time over which a given impulse acts, that decreases the force. Okay? It decreases automatically. It automatically decreases uh, uh, the force. Okay? Because uh, if, 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 if the time to which that force acts on an object increases, then it simply means that you're using a small force. Because if you are using a huge force, you work everything out in a small period of time. That's the concept they're using there. So make sure you, you use those concepts. If time is high, if the time increases, then it means the person is using a small force. And if the force increases, then the person is using a small time. Wow. It means if you are studying, you apply more force. In the exam, you just use 30 minutes to answer everything. But if you are using uh, 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 small force when studying, then of course, you use more time when writing the exam. Even that time will even finish for you because you didn't really put in so much force. Very important concept. The theorem comes into play in the design of a bicycle helmet. The materials inside a bike self safety helmet increase the time of impact, thereby reducing the force and the extent of injury. So here what they are saying is, if I want you to imagine a, a helmet, if you put a helmet to your head and then let's say for example the person riding the bicycle falls to the ground and then they hit their head on the ground the 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 the, the, the helmet has got a cushion inside that cushion it, it is simply there to resist shock so you discover that the, the the time interval at which that shock is going to reach the head is going to be uh, increased it will increase for that shock to reach the head, it will maybe take, let's say, some, some minutes. So due to that increase in time, it means that it is going to decrease the force that is going to reach the head. Therefore, uh, safely protecting that person. Very important concept. Now, let's talk about how we can conserve momentum. Okay? We try to use some momentum. In, in its in that in, in in some initial in some initial instance then we also use the same momentum in the final instance we don't lose anything so i want you to imagine two vehicles one from the left one from the right then they they collide with each other we have not yet started i've not yet started teaching collisions but they collide with each other then of course you expect uh some uh uh there's going to be damage there. But remember, that momentum that was being used before collision, 
it must be recovered after collision. That momentum must be recovered after collision. Now, that recovery of the same momentum which was in the initial place is what we're calling as conserving the momentum. Okay? Now, I want you to remember this formula. We say that impulse is equal to the impulse is equal to the momentum. Okay? So that simply means that the FT is equal to the change in momentum. So FT is going to equal to P final minus PI. That's the change in momentum. Now, based on this definition, if the total force, okay, if the total force, if the total force, um, if the total force is at some angle, then the initial and final momentum must be the same. Okay, this is um, momentum conservation. So P final minus uh, P initial. I'm sure they're, they're just trying to explain whatever. But I'm sure you are getting uh, the concept from my explanation so that you understand everything. So this is conservation of momentum. Okay, it simply says that if the total force acting on an object is zero, its momentum cannot change. In other words, its momentum is conserved. Okay? So, the momentum final must equal the momentum initial. Okay? Momentum initial. That's the law of conservation of momentum. So, only external forces can change a system's momentum. Okay? What do they mean when they say external forces? Remember the, 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 the scenario of a ball. A ball will continue in this state of motion unless an unbalanced force is exerted on it. Then that, that, that unbalanced force is an external force. It's, it's the only thing with, which can change the momentum. Okay? So I'm sure these are the reasons as to why they're trying to explain why that momentum is changing. So I think this is all, this is everything that they're trying to tell you. They're saying that if you have momentum one final, plus momentum two final, plus momentum three final, that must equal to momentum one initial plus momentum two initial. In other words, they're telling you that the momentum which you have at in, 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 the, in the first place must equal the momentum which you have in the final place. That is called conservation of momentum. Okay. So momentum conservation applies to all systems regardless of size. Okay, so this is just the scenario that they're giving you. I'm sure you understand everything. Okay, this is, this is, okay. Okay. I'm sure, this is I'm just trying to give you an instance, an explanation so that you understand. Okay, this is just also a scenario that they're giving you. They want you to understand application, the fabricates, you know. How is it possible that they can just hold that pipe and water is able to move in a straight line. Momentum. Uh, it's just impulse momentum theorem. Okay? So, and conservation of momentum. That's application. Collisions. Okay, so I think I'd mentioned in the first place, collision, we're simply talking about objects that are capable of colliding with one another. Okay, so this concept is simply enables us to calculate um, Momentum before collision and momentum after collision. Now, momentum is conserved when objects collide. However, this does not necessarily mean that kinetic energy is conserved as well. Remember, when two objects collide, momentum is going to be conserved. Okay? The momentum is conserved. I think I explained this in the first place. But what we are saying is, remember, when two objects collide, there is that energy of interaction between the two of them. That energy is the kinetic energy because it keeps them in that state of motion. That's energy in motion. So that kinetic energy is not conserved. Why? Because it increases at some point of collision, but then it reduces when the objects remain in their stationary points. So therefore, it's not conserved. Okay, so this is whatever they're trying to explain. I'm sure you, you, you read this very simple. Okay, I'm sure you're able to see how these people, uh, what is happening here. We have this man trying to hit the ball. He collides with his fellow there. 
you, you put into consideration the momentum before collision and momentum after collision. Of course, if they fall down, you expect them to remain in that state of rest. And that is how we lose kinetic energy. Kinetic energy gradually gets back to zero. Okay, so this is everything that trying to explain under momentum, the, under collisions. The, 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 so this is total momentum MV plus MV2. That is uh, a momentum before collision and momentum after collision. So this is, I think you'll be able to understand all this in our, our questions. So now let's get to be interested in the velocity, in the kinetic energy. Now we said that kinetic energy is not conserved. Kinetic energy is equal to half mv squared. Now, since we have two objects that are colliding, then we expect some mass to double. So if we double the mass, what does that mean? It simply means that we are going to, instead of putting m, we are going to have two m, then inside it will be v over 2. So if you multiply everything, you discover that you have 1 over 4 mv to the power 2. So that is just, um, that is just equal to 1 over 2 ke. Okay, 1 over 2 ke. In other words, you are saying half, then you put 1 over 2 mv to the power 2. So that if you multiply these two, you have 1 over 4. Therefore, one half of the initial kinetic energy is converted into other forms of energy as sound and heat. So what they're trying to explain here is that if you imagine two vehicles colliding, then of course we say that the momentum is conserved. In other words, the momentum that is in the initial place, remember, in the initial place and the momentum in the final place, then of course, remains the same, they are conserved, right? But we say that kinetic energy is not conserved, okay? It, it changes. Why? Because at the point of impact, there are certain things that you must put into consideration. There is heat. Why? Because as they collide with each other, they heat up each other, and at the same time, there is um, sound, okay? So they sound... In, in, in some other vehicles, there are also some, some chemicals produced. So that energy is going to be lost through kinetic, uh, through sound. Some of it is going to be lost through heat, and some of it through maybe chemicals, whatever, and everything. So there is just a reduction of energy at the point of collision. No wonder why one, one, uh, 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 one over two, or let me say half of the kinetic energy is going to be lost at the point of collision. This is just them trying to explain this, okay? So I'm sure you are able to see what's happening here. This is an object before, object after, uh, considering the velocity one equal to V, velocity equal to zero. That is at some point final. Okay, so this formula is very important. So we're saying that this is, this is the this is uh, the initial momentum. So we're saying m1 multiplied by some v1. This is initial. This must equal to you have momentum one times moment. Uh, you have momentum one final plus momentum two final. You may also have momentum three final. You may have momentum one initial, momentum two initial, momentum three initial equal to momentum one final, momentum two final. Remember, they must be added. They must be added in their individual capacities, okay? So I'm sure this is the formula that we are able to see there. If you are considering, uh, remember we said one, one over two of uh, the kinetic energy is lost. So automatically it's going to be one over two mv squared equal to one over two m1 final plus one over two m2 final. You put into consideration of that. So this is just the same as, for example, if you have velocity one, then velocity one final. Remember, this is momentum, so it's mv. So while there is the m, remember you are dealing with some masses uh, from different objects. So you have mass one, 
mass 1 minus mass 2 over mass 1. You just uh, add them like that. Okay? You'll be able to understand in the questions. So this is just all about everything. So there's this last question, uh, the solutions are given to you. You'll be able to understand how everything was done. All right, so we have reached to the end of our session. I'm sure you've grabbed one or two things and right now you are able to um, expand ideas and have uh, a clear concept concerning what momentum and impulse are. In our next tutorial, we will be solving questions together and we shall see how we are able to apply momentum Okay, we will see how we are able to apply the momentum, how we are able to apply the impulse, and at the same time, we'll be able to see how we are able to apply um, how we are able to apply everything. Okay, so sorry about that. Okay, so thank you so much. In the next tutorial, we will be doing questions. So don't forget to subscribe and also hit the like button. Thank you so much. Shalom.